let's add time evolution to our free particle. So we've said that our free particles, we can express them as momentum eigenstate. Great. So now, how would that momentum eigenstate change in time? Now, we've seen that in general, we have to convert our state to an energy eigenstate, and then all you have to do is introduce e to the negative i, e of whatever that state is, t over h bar. We've done that over and over again, whether it was spin or whether it was bound states in a well. So the problem is that here we have p, and this is still true, but we need e. So here's a nice thing. Let's think back to classical mechanics. There is a relationship between energy and momentum. The good news is it's still the same here. So we can actually think about this as E is equal to P squared over 2M. So there's kind of a weird thing here where when I have this state, this actually is kind of an energy eigenstate because this has a well-defined energy. If I have a particle in this state, its energy is going to be consistent. But the trade-off is we can't necessarily go the other way. That if I have an energy eigenstate, that would actually have two possible different values of momentum. So I'm not going to go into great detail in this. Um, this idea, you can think about this in terms of degeneracy, there's different ways to think about it, but the key here that you can think about this is that if I have a particle with a well-defined momentum, it definitely has a well-defined energy, but particles with a well-defined energy could have, say, two different values of momentum if it's just a 1D system. So the good news is that we can treat this as a state with a well-defined energy, which means we can directly drop this term on, but we need to have it this way. But okay, how bad is that? So we take our original spatial uh, function, right? So e to the i px over h bar, and now we're going to multiply it by that time dependence term that we have met so much. But now instead of e, we are going to call this p squared over 2m, right? Rather than just introducing one more term. So now notice that this is now two exponentials multiplied by one another. So once you have those exponentials multiplied by one another, well, we can in fact turn that into one exponential, and I'm gonna write it this way because now it's gonna start getting messy, and we can then add those. So this is i p x over h bar minus i p squared t over 2m h bar. Okay, how visible is that? Slightly visible. So then, we can break this out a little bit more. Nope. Okay, one marker left that's working well. And we can see that every term has an i, p, over h bar, and then on the inside it's going to be x minus and now I brought out one p, but I'm left with p t over 2m. Okay? And so here's, here's the thing, right? We have a position term, and now we have a time term. And this p over 2m is going to be our phase velocity. And so there's this idea of when you have wave, waves that are traveling and they're more complex waves, you can have phase velocity and you can have group velocity. So this is going to be our, our phase velocity. And where we're going with this is actually getting towards Fourier analysis, some really proper Fourier analysis. And this is going to look pretty similar to what we were doing in the previous chapter, thinking about how we can take kind of a general wave function and then turn it into an infinite sum of energy eigenstates. So we're going to be doing something similar here. But so the first thing to recognize is that we do in fact get this form for the time evolution of our, let me actually write this out clearly, of our momentum eigenstates, 
And this, so this has one well-defined momentum. And now notice that P could again be positive or negative, which would change the overall behavior. It is going to be sinusoidal because you have that I. So from here, we're going to move on to Fourier analysis and things will get a little more mathematically intense.